Hello and welcome to the History uh, and Games Live podcast. In this series of episodes, we will be talking to historians, game creators, heritage professionals, and others about history, games, and the places where they meet. Before we properly start this episode, this is the first recording in a very much improved setup, I hope. So please do let us know what you like about how we look now and what else to improve. We are always looking to improve how we look and sound. This is a very much a one-man production and trying my best to improve uh, with every episode. This being said, in this episode, I, Edward Gafton, your host for the podcast, am pleased to be joined by Dave Beck. Dave is a practicing 3D digital game and new media artist and designer living in Wisconsin. Beck's artwork has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, Sculpture Magazine, National Geographic, the journal Science, and the book Game Scenes, Art in the Age of Video Games. His first game project was the award-winning uh, indie video game Tombeau, a, a first-person exploration game set in a historically accurate environment wherein players can explore the convergence between cultures and the environment across a few hundred years of American history. That was, that was quoting from the website. Now, with his upcoming game, Distilled, he's looking forward to publishing his first ever board game. Dave, thank you so much for being on. How are you today? I am wonderful. Thank you, Edward, so much for, for having me on this podcast. As you know, uh, not only history and games are near and dear to me, but also Edinburgh and Scotland. So thank yes, you so much. Absolutely. And I will get to, to, to the history of Distilled. But first, for listeners unfamiliar with Dave and Dave's game, Distilled is, and I'm quoting here from the website, a medium weight thematic strategy card game about the science and business of crafting alcoholic spirits in a distillery. Again, very familiar to anyone who knows Edinburgh and just Scotland in general. <laughs> the premise of the game is that, again, quoting, players have inherited a distillery and are hoping to someday achieve the title of master distiller through purchasing goods, building up your distillery and creating the world's most renowned spirits. The Kickstarter campaign for distillery will launch July 6th. Uh, and for more information on this, check the links included with the post with the podcast. As always, uh, every time we mention something, uh, it is very likely that there will be a link in the description or if you're listening in the anchor post and the Spotify post and so on. Furthermore, as Dave already mentioned, uh, this is a special podcast for us both since uh, Dave created a prototype for the still whilst on a trip in Scotland in 2019 whilst uh, on a sabbatical. So Dave... For our listeners from Edinburgh and elsewhere in Scotland, tell me, how did you come up with the idea for Distilled and how has being in Scotland inspired you? Sure, thank you. So uh, it's Scotland is really the root and foundation of the entire game and how it was started. Uh, as you had mentioned, I was lucky enough to have a sabbatical in the uh, fall, in the autumn of 2019. So for about six months, uh, myself and my family were over in Scotland uh, conducting research. So I'm a university professor uh, over in the States, and uh, I had proposed that I wanted to do actually augmented reality and virtual reality research on, on kind of history and artifact in Scotland. So I went over to do that. Uh, but I also uh, am a big, big fan of single malt and mm -hmm. um, toured distilleries, had a lot of drams. Uh, and one night, about a month into it, I couldn't sleep. And out of nowhere, no joke, it just kind of hit me over the head, light bulb popped on um, of how to come up with a, some sort of mechanic in the game, in a board game that would represent um, uh, the d distillation process. So all night, I was I was up all night furiously writing down notes um, about this idea for a game about distilling. Uh, at the time, it was going to be all about distilling whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, and by the morning, I had the, had the name distilled already. I had had uh, many of the mechanics that are still in the game as well. Uh, and being someone who has a background in art and history myself, uh, I knew I wanted to figure out ways to thematically tie that into the game. So that's how it all started uh, in a small little town uh, just outside Edinburgh, Dalkeith. Uh, and I was actually staying at the Dalkeith Palace. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an agreement between my university and uh, the Duke of Buclou, uh to be able to be using that space. We had been for about 30 years. That's changed now. But um, I was one of the last people that got a chance to have that amazing experience. So I spent the entire autumn every day, all day, working on distilled, touring distillers, because distilleries, I had mm -hmm. to do research, of course. Um, uh, and so it wasn't just there, but uh, traveling to different regions of Scotland, learning more about the process, um, the history behind distillation, uh, but behind um, uh, excise, of course, was mm -hmm. a big thing um, uh, in the history of Scotland and how uh, the Highlands came to be with the spirits there too. So lots of touring, lots of talking, lots of interviewing, um, uh, and lots of making and play testing. Uh, and, and now here we are a few, a few, uh, year or so later, um, uh, with the game. 
yeah and, and with the podcast in, in you know in collaboration with the university exactly. so it's, it's kind of full mm -hmm. circle i feel like that's why it I'm, really I'm, is and i'm happy to be to be here with you um so by extension have you collaborated worked with the university of Edinburgh before by any chance you mentioned augmented reality and we talked a bit about this before yeah. the recording yeah so uh it was it was a, a small amount that i would have loved to have dived a little deeper on as well but uh, just to, to talk quickly about the project I was working on, we were looking at trying to figure out how to recreate, for the, sorry, this is for the augmented virtual reality mm -hmm. research that I, I went to Scotland planning to do, um, uh, recreate some objects that still are in existence, but not in the same place. So this might be a sculpture or a, another architectural uh, piece that has been moved uh, over the course of time to another part of, of Scotland or even just the UK. Um, and we knew we wanted to essentially have it so that you could be standing in a space that now feels somewhat modern, hold up your phone. This was the vision, hold mm -hmm. up your phone or iPad or whatever, um, and have superimposed in augmented reality, what that might've looked like at that time period. So, um, uh, what we did was we did collaborate with a lab at the university of Edinburgh that, uh, essentially, at Edinburgh, they, um, had a lab that focused on things like 3d modeling. Yeah. The create um, studio. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the Create Studio. Uh, and I went through some training there as well to be able to use some of those materials uh, and equipment uh, and ended up being able to uh, check out uh, for about a week uh, this fantastic 3D scanner to be able to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. So I still have some of these scans of these uh, amazing artifacts. And I hope to still return to that someday and do that and perhaps hopefully return back to Scotland and, and engage back in with that, uh, that same research. Yeah, it would it would be phenomenal to tour like uh, Scotland with with the and just show it around. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Okay. Let's dive into into the questions into you know per se the interview. Mm -hmm. So the still is your first board game, but as I mentioned before, you've worked in video games. You know, with with Dumbo, and I know mm -hmm. you have an itch your page. So I think you're you know well versed into the the gamer, the, at least in, in the video gamer space. And I see you have a bunch of board games in in, in the background, so you must play board games as well. Yes. <laughs> As a creator, what are the main similarities and differences between the two mediums? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I think uh, at the end of the day for me, uh, some similarities, one of the biggest ones is that my goal as a creator, as a game designer, is I want to tell a story, but I also want that that person experience it to be part of that story mm -hmm. as well, uh, to be able to help them uh, define their own path uh, while also learning something. That's very important to me. So with Tambo, that idea of, yes, I have a story laid out. It's almost like an interactive film where you're experiencing this, but you can kind of choose your path as you navigate that space and that timeline. Um, but also at the same time, I want uh, to be able to tell a story to that player too. So the same thing happens in Distilled as well, where uh, I'm giving them the different elements that they're going to construct their own story. Obviously more about gameplay than story with something like a board game uh, in this case. Um, uh, so I think that's one, one similarity. Um, obviously another one is that idea that it needs to be rich in my, my opinion needs to be equally rich in interactivity or gameplay mm -hmm. and visuals. Um, I think that's another, uh, beautiful part of our medium in games is that it's not just about, um, us watching something, but it's about us engaging in it, but it also has to be visually rich. I really think that's important uh, to a, a successful game experience, whether that's about uh, immersiveness uh, or it's it's just about something that helping people understand kind of the UX of, of how to interact with something, the mm -hmm. user interaction. Uh, so those are those would be a couple similarities. Uh, one more, actually, I'm going to say one more too, uh, is uh, the importance, in my opinion, not everybody's going to feel mm -hmm. this way, but in my opinion of collaboration. I think um, collaboration is so important in developing these projects Yes, some of these are done by individuals. Um, uh, and one could even argue that large amounts of, of these projects were done by just me, more mm -hmm. so with Tombo. Um, I've learned over the course of many projects that collaboration is so key because you just simply can't do everything. Um, and to have other experts from those fields come together and bring their their talents to the table, I think is is such a key element. So those are some similarities. Um, I think a, a, a dissimilarity normally would be, of course, um, the idea of working with technology versus not. Um, mm -hmm. uh, with board games, uh, before the pandemic, which we can get to later. but before Yeah, we the will, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, Distilled was and now back is very much an analog experience. Mm -hmm. Me cutting up in Scotland every day. I was I was cutting things up, uh, um, 
printing things out, cutting things up, laying them on the table. That tactile quality is such an important element of both the game player and the game designer's experience. Well, of course, that's a very different thing with a, a, um, a video game or a computer game, usually. Um, uh, so I think that's one big dissimilarity. Uh, I think the other one, too, is that, uh, in my opinion, at least, the visual environment or actually the environment in general is much easier to control in a board game mm -hmm. because you're creating those components uh, and you're laying them and you're putting them in a box and people can lay them out. Yes, they could, I guess, choose to make different rules uh, and do things differently, like take a card and instead of holding it in their hand, throw it across the room or rip it up and break the rules of what the, uh, the system is set up in the game. But generally speaking, I know once I lay out the rules for someone to follow in a game that they're going to follow them. Uh, and after, if I've play tested enough, it's probably going to be okay um, uh, after a successful play test. But with a video game, there's so many opportunities for bugs and errors mm -hmm. and things that could break or people find out things. I play tested Tombow quite, quite a lot. Um, and I had a lot in terms of letting other people play mm -hmm. it. But um, even to this day, bugs continue to pop up that I have to figure out squash, right? And go back and because someone finds it out uh, because of that infinite kind of 3D space that it could exist, people are going to find uh, uh, things that happen with a computer that aren't necessarily always going to be as easy as something you can rely on for a tactical quality. Mm -hmm. So that'd be another thing I'd say as well. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking now, like with Dumbo in particular, like early access is a phenomenon that happens in games. And I know you, with, with this still you have sent uh, preview copies, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, How, mm -hmm. I feel like it's another level of commitment to just release an, a video game and say, hey, this is an early access, this is kind of like an alpha, a beta, a demo, whatever. But with this still you have actually printed, you've actually invest, started investing into this project. So like in terms of distribution, how do you feel about like you know getting the game in the hands of players like does does it necessarily have to be later on in the process for like board games rather than for example with the video games yeah that's a great question um i think what's interesting there and i'm i'm going to sort of answer your question but also answer it with something else too uh when i when i made tombo i've learned a lot since then uh, and when i made tombo i was making that for myself uh, as a passion project that I wanted people to play and experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did play test it, but looking back, I didn't play test it nearly. I didn't take the play testing yeah. process, user experience process nearly enough, uh, nearly as serious as I should have or done it as extensively. So like you're talking about early access, I didn't do early access. If I could mm -hmm. go back, I probably would have done that to be able to get a lot of that because that's exactly what I'm doing now with Distilled is that it's early access, whether it's digitally online uh, and allowing people to play that or um, uh, printing copies, which is absurdly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but what that does is I realize at the end of the day, if I want to be able to be successful with this project, it really needs to, um, uh, a and, and people are going to be paying a certain amount of money, much more than Tom Bo. This needs to, to really um, uh, fire in all cylinders and be yeah. successful in that sense and play smoothly. So yeah, it's it's a it's a very different process, um, and I would argue just because there's such a heavier focus on gameplay with Distilled than there was with Tombow, where it was more of an, a walking simulator, interactive film, mm -hmm. uh, if you will, that uh, I have to be that much more diligent diligent about play testing and user experience with something like this with a board game. Mm. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and. Again, to go on to these like comparisons, you said, you know, Tombow is a, a walking simulator, which is, you know, mm -hmm. a, a term in video games. It, mm -hmm. It's anyway an exploration game set in a historically accurate 3D environment. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your your project with augmented reality of like recreating mm -hmm. this historical element. Is the goal for this still to be historically accurate? Because it doesn't seem so. Yeah, very good question. Um I, I would say that it's not, it's, it's definitely uh, historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it is trying as best possible at all times to be authentic and historically accurate when it needs to be, uh, but also representative of many cultures around the world, uh, and time periods. So, uh, some examples of that, I've got a couple things I can, uh, hold up perhaps as an example. Um, this, in this, uh, this card here, um, is, and you can kind of see it a little bit there, mm -hmm. but is one of the 12 people you would play with in the game, play from uh, as in the game. Uh, you've inherited this distillery from this individual. That's why it's a framed portrait. Uh, her name is Jacqueline Booker. Uh, and she is from the Americas in this case, in the game from Kentucky. And we've uh, written stories, uh, backstories, biographies 
on each of these characters mm -hmm. in the back of the cards. What we've tried to do is be as historically accurate as possible, but these are not um, uh, real people. Actual people. Yeah. Yes. So we've referenced time periods. We've uh, tried to use uh, jargon uh, from certain time periods depending on what it is. Um, uh, and that's been very important to us. So much so, and I should note that this was this is all written by our artist, Eric Evanson. So mm -hmm. he's, of course, a background with graphic novels and comics. Um, uh, and so he has that background to be able to write those. But we've also uh, hired on a cultural consultant oh, uh, for the game as well. We have felt this is very important for the game because of the fact that we're representing countries and people from all around the world in all different time periods. That it was really important to us that to not only to educate others about these uh, about these people or these experience, these types of uh, spirits and people that you'd be making them, but also to make sure that we're being respectful of those cultures mm -hmm. and time periods too. So that was a really important part of this too. So I would say, again, to long answer your question, but it's more historical fiction, but we're taking it very as seriously as we can. Everything from the objects, the bottles, the barrels, the ingredients, uh, every single card in the game has some sort of, and you're not gonna be able to read that, but that tiny is cool. white yeah. text. Uh, yeah, and at the bottom, tiny text at the bottom of this, uh, you can't read it all because it's so small. Um, these are fu fun facts or, or no, factoids yeah. that, that have historical uh, facts as well in them too. Yeah, a few, uh, a few notes on this. Obviously, for listeners of the podcast, Eric was on our uh, uh, Marrying Mr. Darcy episode. It is the exact same person. So if you're curious to see what he thinks about, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, accuracy in, in, in board games, please do check out that episode. And uh, second thing, it's interesting to me that you hired a cultural uh, like advisor slash assistant. That, that is fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Uh, again, um, I'm... I'm well, kind of one of my next next question is you said you know like you want to represent people from all around the world how about people uh from you know cultures where drinking is not really mm. not really a thing or not like even like you know cultures where like drinking is you know not necessarily like how how to put it sensibly it, it's not part of the religion it's not part of the culture yeah. at all it's, yeah. it's called yeah. upon like how how do you cater to players for whom like alcohol you know is is a problem yeah, yeah, great question, Edward. So there's two there's two answers to somewhat two answers to that. First, um, in the game, uh, when it's on Kickstarter, when it first releases, there will be about uh, between nine and twelve. Right away at nine, and we hope to unlock even more uh, of those identities of people uh, that you can play with. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as the game as the campaign extends uh, and hopefully does well, we will be adding more and more and more up to almost twenty of these different identities. And this is also including, so identities from around the world. This is including um, identities even in our expansion that we're offering from Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And that's a good example of certain countries, um, especially in the Middle East, that uh, either alcohol is banned or obviously is a part of their religious practice is, is something that is not acceptable. Uh, and so we've tried to be respectful of those areas. So it's not like we're going to have... Um, uh, uh, someone from a country where alcohol is banned, all of a sudden, that's one of the people on the card. Like, yeah. hey, look, they just like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're trying to be respectful of that. And then to answer your question uh, in another way too, um, I've I've run across um, a handful of people that have said, "I'm not interested in playing mm -hmm. your game. I don't drink. I'm a, I, you know, I I have no interest in that." And I completely respect that. Um, I try and uh, explain to them that obviously this is not a game about drinking at all. Mm -hmm. It's a game about the the creation of the spirit. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, I like to liken it to almost like alchemy, or um, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually uh, interestingly enough, that's how distilling began. The history of distillation is actually th through alchemy uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, so, but regardless, uh, aside from that, I try and tell them it's not about that. It's about this idea of taking recipes and ingredients. It's the mm -hmm. science and the business behind distillation, which is very true in this, in this case of the game, um, where you are trying to run a business, you're trying to figure out different recipes to make different spirits, uh, and how you can afford it and how you can make that happen. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, it's something that we need to be aware of and we are trying to be respectful of is the fact that this is not going to be for everybody. Uh, but we also want to make sure people understand it's not a drinking game because unfortunately many times a board game about alcohol, all of a sudden, that, Oh, it must be a yeah, drinking game. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting separation between the, you know, the act of making alcohol, the act of, you know, like distilling spirits and actually, mm -hmm. you know, drinking them like, yeah. Interesting. Um, you mentioned the history of distillery. Can we learn mm -hmm. about the history of distillery from from like the tiny facts written in, in, in the cards? Yes. Is that, is that a thing? 
Yes, yes. So uh, some of the um, some of the cards, I don't think I have one with me to show you as an example, but I have something close, kind of. Here's some Scottish some Scottish history. Perfect. Um, uh, so so a big so yes, you will. So both the the origins of distilling uh, you'll be able to learn about in the game. Much of that might be connected more through uh, the African Middle East expansion, mm -hmm. like I mentioned. Uh, it began more with uh, alembic stills uh, that were a certain type of still design that you could actually have in your distillery in this game. You could buy that, uh, but you could also perhaps um, buy uh, a spirit safe. Uh, a spirit mm -hmm. safe is something that is found in uh, nearly all, if not every single um, uh, uh, single malt distillery in Scotland, uh, and is much more of something you'd find here as opposed to there in, as opposed to in the states. Uh, this, of course, uh, there's some really interesting stuff about spirit safe because they all exist because of excise taxes um, uh, on spirits. Um, anymore, it's more of a showpiece uh, in a distillery tour, quite honestly. Uh, but it was a way, the ability for uh, the distiller to be able to access and control making the cuts of the runoff of mm -hmm. the still without actually talk, uh, touching it. So there'd be a big lock on that. And only the excise man would have access to that safe. Uh, um, uh, so that's where the origin of the spirit safe came. Um, another good example, really quick, is the Doig ventilator. So also known as a cupola ventilator. This was uh, uh, invented by a, an individual named, I believe, Charles, Charles Doig. Um, modeled after the cupolas that we might find uh, over in the east, so mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, um, but a great way to ventilate um, uh, uh, in the maltings of the distilleries in Scotland. And you'll see those, of course, uh, capped uh, all across the landscape of Scotland on the distilleries uh, for their maltings. Um, uh, and again, there too is something that, yes, it's more of an of a aesthetic element at, the, at this point, uh, but still a very important part of Scottish distilling history mm -hmm. as well. Fascinating. I, I have a selfish question. So listeners, I'm, yeah. I apologize in advance. <laughs> I, I'm Romanian. Is there any Eastern European representation? I, I... Uh, yes. So, um, uh, is, is it, um, uh, it's Slovo, uh, Slovovich, uh, it, it's a, it's a certain, uh, spirit made from, I think, plums or figs. Um, in, in your region. I can't remember exactly what it, it's called. Slavovich? Doesn't sound similar, but to anything oh, Slivovich, I know. Slivovich, Slivovich, I think. But uh, yes, so um, we're going to have um, uh, a few different people that uh, uh, would be making vodka because, of course, that of was course, something yeah. that, was, that was very, very familiar to that region. Um, we also have some that uh, in the game ingredients like figs and plums that are, are things that people could make a spirits from. Uh, so yeah, we've tried to hit uh, lots of different regions. No, no one yet from specifically Romania, Romania but you know, time will tell yeah, well, as no, far yeah, as yeah. Uh, the distillers that continue to be added to the table. So wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. excited uh, for your stretch goals. I'm, I'm excited for you to like, you know, like have uh, keep adding uh, people. Yeah, from, I really from hope. Everywhere. I really hope it does well because we have some really neat things. We just can't afford the real quick. The game has over 350 cards. Yeah. Um, and so it's exp quite expensive to make, which is fine. We want to do this, um, but in order to even add more, we hope to have over 400, even more than that, in the in the final game. But in order to do that, we have to raise enough money to to, to print of more. Course, so that's yeah. why that, you know. um, I'm going to ask you a question that uh, we ask everyone that comes in the podcast, and mm -hmm. it's really imperative to us. Um, should games be historically accurate, um, mm -hmm. and you know, especially games like Distilled or like? And if if so, if this is true, are there aspects of the game design that are changed or left out entirely to accommodate like accuracy? Like, are there any ideas that like you had again when when prototyping uh, the still that you were like, oh, this is really interesting from a gameplay from a gameplay you know standpoint, but it, it hasn't really happened. Or it, we can't really fit it like to make sense in a historical you know mm -hmm. setting. What are some ideas that you might have left behind because it doesn't sure. really work? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I am a, a very big believer in, in games being historically accurate when they have to do with uh, history, obviously, or if they are acknowledging that they're trying to represent our current reality. Mm -hmm. 
right? Obviously, if we have something that might be, uh, well, I shouldn't say obviously, if we have something that might be uh, sci-fi or um, some other reality or some other world, um, I, I think that's our opportunity to be able to expand uh, into new alternate universes, alternate realities. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if we're trying to uh, represent something like Distilled is, that is a, a, a real profession, a real industry, I believe it's extremely important to be historically accurate. accurate. Now, with that said, you asked about gameplay too. Uh, and I would go so far as to say, maybe not even just talking about accuracy, but authenticity as far as the different types of processes or, or how something's made or how it works. Yeah. So um, it with, for me, theme, which is kind of what I think about as authenticity is very important in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, ha the way I've tried to describe it to people um, is that uh, when I, well, when I first made distill, when I first came up with the idea it was chock full of historical accurate, authentic processes for how I wanted to represent this as much as I could about how spirit is made, how, how whiskey, for instance, is made. Um, over the course of playtesting, I discovered that, um, that if, and I talk about it like a spectrum, mm -hmm. and if on one side of the spectrum is accuracy and authenticity and fact, uh, and the other side of the spectrum is um, uh, kind of fun, like pure fun or pure gameplay, I could say. I found that uh, when I first came up with this still, that was probably right around here, mm -hmm. very close to authenticity. So I had, for example, for those that are aware of how um, uh, whiskey works and spirits work, uh, when you make whiskey and you age it, uh, this is just one example. Um, it sits in a barrel in a warehouse for a number of years, uh, for a couple years at least, in order to actually be called uh, three years, in order to be called Scotch whiskey or single malt. Um, uh, uh, and from there, uh, when it ages, of course, it it takes in the flavors of the barrel. So of the mm -hmm. wood barrel, oftentimes a barrel that is actually from the Americas used in the bourbon industry and then shipped over. The, the Scots got really smart and realized that um, as opposed to why should we make new barrels? We can just use the ones that America's yeah. getting rid of. Like, yes, please. Uh, it makes our spirit taste that much better. So that's what we've been, they've been doing for years. Well, anyway, it, it sits in the barrel. It, it gets this great flavor. That's what makes it uh, the color. Before that, it was just pure, clear. But also, as it ages, uh, a little bit of the spirit gets evaporated out of the barrel. And of course, we call that in Scotland, the angel's share, uh, mm -hmm. where we're giving the angels a little bit of the, the spirit to the heavens. Um, and so over the course of, of, of uh, barrel's time, let's say, if it's, if it's full, like this is the side view, of the, the front view of a barrel, full up to here with spirit, if it ages for, let's say, 15 years, you're actually going to only have about that much spirit mm -hmm. uh, uh, after it ages. It's all evaporated. That's the angel share. So in the game, I wanted to represent that. So I actually had players have this spirit in their warehouse. And I can just hold this up real quick now. You can see that your stack yeah. would, of, of cards would sit here. Um, uh, perhaps you'd have, let's see if I can get a barrel. Perhaps you, you'd have a, a nice uh, ex-bourbon hogshead barrel uh, aging with all your spirit in the warehouse. It's a stack of cards. Um well, what I had players do is at the end, when they're ready to sell that, put it in a bottle and sell it, I had them shuffle the cards up, fan the cards out, and the person to their left was the angel, and they had to pull a card for every year, for every round mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. it was in there. Well, that was fun, and it was neat to represent that idea of you're losing spirit. You don't really know what you're losing because it's just evaporating. But the problem was people were losing really important cards, and they were just mm -hmm. like, this is... I get the fact what you're doing. You're showing like this idea, but this is not fun. I just went from making a whiskey to a moonshine, even yeah. though that thing's been storing there for, for years, for rounds. So that's one example. I know that's a long-winded example, but what I realized was that I needed to bring that that gauge closer to the middle mm -hmm. um, to ha still have certain elements of authenticity, history, fact, but also I got to give way for gameplay as well. So people are having fun. And it makes sense. And it's not just too, too uh, complex of a system that it's going to turn people away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a bunch of the problems, like I know we speak with um, educators about like, hey, like how well are some like fun, you know, pedagogical projects that you can you can you can craft. And there's always a discussion between like, we're not not really sure like if it's educational or if it's for fun. There's always this this tension, right? It's it's a complicated matter. That's why we even asked this question of like game designers such as yeah, such, such as you because we have to find some sort of balance in between these two things. Mm -hmm. 
I want to ask you, just just moving on, like, what do you think are the main strengths of this build as a game? You know, like we we spoke about its value as like you know you might you might learn something about the uh the history of of um you know distilling alcohol but like mm -hmm. what as a game how yeah. how does it stand out in, in a sea of board games and a sea of other uh, kickstarters yeah, definitely definitely i think probably three things um the first one is definitely hands down theme uh so and i don't mean that like it's alcohol yeah it's theme. Yeah. i mean that i've worked extremely hard to make sure that the theme and the mechanics are intertwined in everything they do. So I, that example I was giving you is one, but uh, there's still many others. There's about how the distillation process works, aging works, selling works, acquiring materials, upgrading your distillery. I've tried very hard to have this rich with theme. And from what I've uh, gotten feedback on from play testers and reviewers is that that's tenfold. Like they, they um, th this is in a small group of games that ha has marries the mm -hmm. two so well. So that's very good and very exciting to me. So if you're someone that likes theme in your games, yet it's a Euro game. So those that know what Euro means, it's 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 less take that and lucky. It's more about strategy mm -hmm. and uh, working on your own to, to accomplish a goal. Uh, so it's a highly thematic game. Uh, I think uh, secondly, the, the next thing I'd say would be that um, the artwork, uh, and again, this is all kudos to Eric, uh, is really phenomenal. So it's not just uh, like I, I'll hold it up again. Uh, it's not just um, this distillery player board. Every single person has one of these in front of them. Uh, but also the cards in the game and the illustrations in the game, I've showed you some of them. Um, but everything from, uh, let's see if I can get one up here. Uh, when you add, you add flavors to your spirits when you're aging them mm -hmm. in the warehouse and you don't necessarily know what they are, uh, but these sketches um, uh, to different uh, bottles and barrels. Um, here's a here's a sketch of a, a an agave. So if you're making tequila, this could go yeah. into your tequila. So um, I've been really just floored by uh, the beautiful work Eric's done on the game. So I think that's another thing. The, the visual experience is a, a really great one. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say the main hook of the game, the gameplay element, uh, is when you're distilling. You're going to toss all your ingredients into a washback, which is a giant tub mm -hmm. where you're throwing your yeast, your water, and your, your, your grains like, you know, uh, barley, for instance. Um, uh, and then from there, when you toss those in, you're going to let that ferment and you're going to count the number of uh, sugars, the grains you have in there, and you're going to add alcohol cards uh, equal to that. So for if I had two uh, barley in there, I'd add two alcohol cards. These are worth money and they grow your deck. So you're growing a stack of cards you've got, you're, you're mixing a batch of. You're then going to mix all those up and you're going to take the top card and the bottom card and you're going to remove them. And you're going to put them back into your pantry uh, to use in a future round. And what I'm trying to do there thematically is represent the distillation process. The first part of the run that comes off the still and the last part is toxic. It'll blind you. It's mm -hmm. not good for you. But distillers reuse it. So I'm trying to do that same thing. And it's a fun push your luck element that you can do things to mitigate it, add more ingredients buy upgrades that allow you not to pull those cards. Um, uh, so there's ways around it. But what I'm trying to do is engage that sense of like uh, fun, but also kind of tension. Oh, am I going to lose that card? I need to make single malt scotch uh, if I pull that. Um, so I'd say those are the three uh, three things that probably best make this unique and things I don't think you're going to necessarily find in a typical game. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I'm I'm sold. You know, like I'm I'm, I'm curious <laughs> to, to try myself uh, at some point. I want to ask you. I just I just came up with this question uh, while you were mm -hmm. you were talking. Um, you mentioned interviewing distillers. What did they say? What did people with the profession say about your game? What do they like about it? You know, like and, yeah. and like most interestingly, what's one thing you thought about like distillery bef uh, and the process? before you started working or like, you know, throughout the, the process of like making the game, what's one thing that like changed your mind about like the entire process? Um, I think that, uh, well, to answer that, that first, I think the, 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 the taking the, the head and the tail cut, um, which is that first part and the end part of the run, that's what really helped me realize. And that's the thing that sparked in my head right away when I first made the game, thought of the game, it was that. Because I realized I could make something with cards and I could have you take the top card and the bottom card and that mm -hmm. symbolized that idea. So I'd say that would be something that really rang true with that, that process. Um, but also the romance or the romantic nature of distillation is so interesting um, from us. Uh, I mean, you're, you're starting with three ingredients. That's it. Water, yeast, and barley in the case of single malt. 
or water, yeast, and corn in the case of, of a bourbon. Um, uh, and so I, I, I find that fascinating too, that you're starting with something so simple and you're ending up making something so complex, but it has to go through all these different stages. Mm -hmm. It has to go through this giant, you know, copper thing, the still it's got to, uh, it's got to sit in a wooden barrel in the dark. Um, and then it's got to go into a bottle, but you also have to promote that and sell that distribute it. And I find that so fascinating in talking to distillers or in talking to blenders, um, uh, as well as just aficionados of, of, of mm -hmm. single malt and others. Um, many of them have been thoroughly impressed by the fact that, again, I'm, I've been able to, to, again, somewhat represent that industry in that way. Um, one thing that I, I have yet to add that I need to add, and I know I do, and I'm not sure if I'm going to add it to the base game or it's going to be a future expansion is taxes. So, uh, mm -hmm. Um, that's the thing that almost every person I talk to in the industry brings up is that the thing I've, I've noticed is you don't have anything about taxes and that's a huge regular regulations, taxes, the government. Um, and so that's a fascinating side that I think I'm going to probably incorporate, not even just in a single card, uh, but perhaps in some sort of expansion down mm -hmm. the right way I've got kind of rolling around in my head. Um, so those would be a couple of things I'd say, uh, in, in talking to individuals and observing the distillery mm -hmm. industry. And I'm I'm thinking even like about like you know stuff like the prohibition like exactly prohibiting yep. alcohol yeah it can be exactly a... prohibition trying so I'm, I'm I've got some ideas about that uh, and both of those are are so similar you know one is uh, in both cases trying to either get around something or comply mm -hmm. and what happens when you do those two things and my my challenge as a game designer is I like to make sure that if you if you have those two options both are winning strategies or mm -hmm. different ways, right? And so how, how can I design a game around that? Uh, which is very similar to what I'm doing right now with the game where we've got aged spirits, but we've also got unaged spirits. And um, for anyone that knows, uh, has toured some distilleries, especially new ones, knows that um, when a, a whiskey distillery first starts, they can't sell their whiskey. They have to have it sit in a warehouse for a number of years. So they're losing money. So they have to do something else. And many of them end up making gin or they make vodka because you can just you can turn that out and sell it right mm -hmm. away um so trying to kind of look at that balance in the game has been really interesting how i can represent that side of the industry um in distilled has been has been a great challenge too uh i'm, I'm thinking now like you mentioned earlier that you know you've you've collaborated more now with with distilled uh but also i i realized that like this still can also be played solo um mm -hmm. What do you think is the value of, of playing this still by yourself? You know, you mentioned earlier that like, you know, it feels like board games are about collaboration and I have the sense of that as well. Uh, what is the value of playing it by yourself? Like, what can you learn? You know, how can you have fun by, by yourself with Distilled? Yeah, yeah, great question. So yeah, Distilled is actually for one to four players, not two to four, mm -hmm. one to four, like you said. Uh, and the re reason for that is that we've got a dedicated solo um, uh, experience. Uh, and... Because Distilled is a Euro style game, uh, which again means that much of, although there are people who might be playing around the table with you, much of what you're concentrating is right in front of you and you're mm -hmm. trying to do that. Um, and so I knew that uh, Distilled would do very well with a solo experience too, because you're essentially already starting to do, do some of that uh, with, within a multiplayer game too. So with the solo game, you essentially have a series of goals and challenges set before you uh, that are laid on top of the main game. So you're, it'd be like you playing the game with other people, but instead you have certain things, achievements, if you will, that you have to try and obtain, uh, uh, strive for. And it's essentially a tree that you have to kind of, well, it's actually a, the shape of a barrel, uh, a tree that you have to weave through as far as different goals that and cards you have to uncover. So I think the important thing to, to note there is that first and foremost, uh, solo uh, experiences are always great if you're wanting to learn the game to be able to teach it to others. Because if I get the game delivered to my house after I've backed it on Kickstarter uh, and I open it up, I'm really excited for a game night. I could just watch a lot of videos and I could read it or mm -hmm. I could play the solo game because it's using 85% of the main game. Uh, and then on top of that, so I'm not only learning the game, but I'm having fun as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one important part, I think, of solo games that people um, are starting to realize is another way to learn a game and teach it then. Um, I think the other one too is that oftentimes, especially during a pandemic, um, uh, you might not have people to play with uh, um, around the table. You can play online, but it's just not the same sometimes. And so the solo experience is a way to be able to still do that, um, where you can go at your own pace. Um, I know I've got some friends, maybe I'm one of them sometimes, mm -hmm. is AP prone, analysis paralysis. They 
they have three choices in front of them and they can't figure out which one. So it's going to take them like 10 minutes and everyone else is like checking their phones, mm -hmm. going for a drink. Right. Um, but with solo, there's no pressure. Take as long as you want. Right. So I think that's another cool advantage to solo modes uh, that gives people that flexibility. And it's almost, I feel like you, you, you achieve a sense of relaxation and I'll, I don't know, I wouldn't go so far as meditation, but mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relaxing experience when you're playing a solo game because you don't have that added pressure. You can just go at your own pace, kind of like playing a, a, a video game on your own versus against people and trying to, mm -hmm. trying to rush and win or get to something, you know. So I'm interested uh, in, in the idea, like the romantic idea of like you being almost like a distiller yourself, right? When you play on your own, because I feel to me, as, at least not, you know, for, for someone not being very like, uh, educated about like you know the history of distilled uh, mm -hmm. spirits to me it's a very solitary experience mm -hmm. and to me playing this game is kind of like almost like emulating that experience yeah, which is definitely. which is interesting um you mentioned the pandemic just now and mm -hmm. i do have a, a a few questions related to like you know mm -hmm. obviously distilled almost kind of came to be w together with the pandemic with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic and I want to ask you just a broad question to kick off this this part of the, mm -hmm. the podcast how has the pandemic affected uh, you know uh, an impacted development yeah oh man so uh, it's it's a it's a it's a double-edged sword it's 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 been interesting because of course I I, I came up with the idea and I had the paper, paper prototype in Scotland and I play tested that uh almost daily for for a couple months and we got back uh, to the state side and uh, did the same thing for a couple more months. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, and I'd probably play tested it by that point, going to a couple conventions, cons mm -hmm. as well. I'd probably play tested it, I don't know, 50 times total by then, maybe, maybe 35, 40 times total. Um, the pandemic hit and I didn't know what to do because I realized, uh, what, you know, how am I going to be able to get people around the table? Uh, we were playing, my friends and I were actually in the middle of an Imperial Star Wars Imperial Assault campaign. Yes. Um, uh, and which is a really fun uh, cooperative game. If people like that type of thing and like the Star Wars universe, I highly recommend it. Um, but anyway, we were in the middle of it and we thought, what are we going to do? And I did a little bit of snooping and I found out that Tabletop Simulator mm. has has the, that ability. I'd never played Tabletop Simulator before. Um, uh, and so I decided to download it and realize, wait a minute, this is just a 3d sandbox. I can, mm -hmm. I can put distilled in here. Wait a minute. So I, I just like dove in deep. Uh, I've, I've got well over a thousand hours, probably more like 1500 hours now in, in tabletop simulator where I was able to work with a friend of mine here at the university, um, who's a computer scientist. Uh, he helped script the, the experience as well so that it's a smoother experience. Uh, and from there. Um, we now have a fully playable mod on Tabletop Simulator, and I probably have gotten over, well over 200 play tests now because of that. It's available to people around the world. I've met people around the mm -hmm. world. My developer, uh, I would never have met my solo designer or my developer. Um, they're both in the UK. They're both uh, uh, south and down south in England. Um, I would never have met them if it hadn't have been for the pandemic. Meeting them at conventions and play testing groups uh, online. Uh, and because of that, between them and others, fans all around the world, mm -hmm. it's been played hundreds of times. Um, so I think that on that side, it's been amazing. And really quickly on the back side, though, the thing that has really hurt me that I'm trying to make up for now is that once the pandemic hit and once I put it onto Tabletop Simulator, I didn't touch the physical game mm -hmm. at all. I didn't, I didn't touch it at all until... I printed my first prototype copy. This was probably a couple months ago now. Got it back to the table and realized, oh my gosh, I you know this game has gone through so much change over the last year, and it's all in this virtual space. This is not going to work on the table. Mm -hmm. Like there is way too much setup because in Tabletop Simulator, it's always set up right right yeah. away when you you don't have to clean up. Setting up is a is a pain. Clean up is a pain. Now I need to redevelop how I'm approaching this. So. I've furiously gone through some development phases there. So that'd be one tip for anyone that is doing that. <laughs> do both, do both at the same time. Cause my gosh, even though I had that thought in the back of my head, um, I had no idea how far down the rabbit hole of table of virtual I had gone mm -hmm. um, to make it not unplayable, but just to make it not, not a, a, a an ideal experience in the real world uh, um, in, in that sense. So, 
Yeah, double-edged sword for sure. Yeah, for listeners unfamiliar with Tabletop Simulator, it's a Steam video game, which, as Dave just said, it's a 3D sandbox. You can play, I think, every single board game as long as it's modded. Uh, certainly the most popular ones are there. Uh, it's basically a way, as they've uh, already mentioned, of getting together with everyone around the virtual table. And it is very physical, as in you you know, you actually move pieces, you you, you do interact with elements on, on a virtual board. So it is, for many, I believe, and even for myself, I, I've played a bit of it, a, a nice, you know, way of keeping in touch with board games during during the, the um, pandemic. Um, interestingly, you say it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I know, uh, obviously, I have a link to your mod on Tabletop Simulator, so like everyone at home can can try it out. Uh, I have joined your Discord server as well, and it's it's been wonderful to me for me to see to see you really like have a, a massive presence online. Like I know uh, I've, I've, I've done, you know, uh, three or four episodes of the, of the podcast and many people, you know, are very physical because the board game itself, you know, is a, is a very physical, you know, experience, but I, I see you being out there on the internet, out there in the virtual world. So I suppose a question is, have you ever considered like making distilled in a virtual board game adaptation? Like as in the video game, I know, for example, Wingspan just came out with a yeah. actual, mm -hmm. you know, video game you can buy it on the PlayStation, you can buy it on the Switch. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider distilled to, to become, to make the transition from a board game to a video game? Is that something that's yeah. on the cards for you? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, that's funny, Edward. I think this is maybe the first time someone's asked me that. And I, I, I think it's too early to tell right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that uh, what exists on Tabletop Simulator is largely thanks to Seth Barrier, my my good friend and colleague that has been helping with scripting. He's also right now working on a, a mod, a, more of a demo mod for it for Tabletopia, which is a free um, uh, uh, online uh, board game uh, space. So um, we're trying to do that. Uh, would we ever pursue it so that it would be a dedicated, uh, like you said, fully playable on PlayStation or somewhere else? Yeah, perhaps. And I think, I think what will be important is to see how successful the Kickstarter project is, mm -hmm. uh, and um, to see, because uh, frankly, beyond our community of of fans and and what I call them distillers, uh, distillers. that are part of our Facebook group and and our Discord group. Um, I don't know. I this is it. This is Kickstarter is such an amazing, interesting space. I don't know how well it's going to be received. Mm -hmm. I hope very much, knock on wood, that it that it funds. Uh, but beyond that, I think time will tell. And that's a good example of some of the things that would be really great to do someday, um, or to consider to do perhaps. And if there's enough love for it, I mean, you know, Wingspan is just such a fantastic mm -hmm. game, and it's really uh, gotten into the onto the tables of people that normally don't play games. Um, Maybe Distilled will will uh, have even just a, a small iota fraction of that success, and that would be amazing. Uh, and who knows? Yeah, perhaps uh, someday we might see it on uh, more digital platforms as well. Mm -hmm. I want to speak about Kickstarter. It's, it's it's something I haven't mentioned. So, like with Dumbo, you were on Itch.io, you know, which is again for listeners and viewers, is a popular site for indie video games. But from from Itch.io to Kickstarter, it's a, it's a gulf. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a massive difference. How did you find that trans that transition to, oh. to, to be like, how is working with Kickstarter? Yeah. So, um, I think I, I remember, I don't know who, I'm sure someone's been quoted as, as saying this, uh, but I, 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 I've heard it many times. Um, I set out to design a game two years ago when I came up with the distilled or less, a little less than two years ago. Um, and I wanted to uh, create a board game, design and create a board game and have it published. Little did I know that in reality, I was becoming more of like this, basically running a company, uh, founding a company, running a company, um, Kickstarter is part of that. And um, that was my choice, right? So I, I could have said, no, here, I've got an idea. A year ago, a year and a half ago, I could have said, I've got an idea for a game. It's about distilling. Who wants to buy this idea? Publishing companies. Who wants to buy this? And then that would be it. I'd be the designer, but it mm -hmm. would be more of their baby. But in this case, it's my baby. Um, and so uh, that process and learning about the the ropes of Kickstarter has been, like you said, a golf is a perfect example. Um, it's been unbelievable. Uh, knowing that I needed to hit certain funding levels um, to be able to make this successful meant that I had to kind of basically backtrack my schedule almost well over a year probably a year and a half um to say well i need to uh, find someone to make the video 
I need to um, uh, find people to do the previews. Mm -hmm. I need to uh, print uh, copies of the game for those people to do the previews. I need to start a mailing list. It was all these things to build up all to this one single moment, which will be on July 6th, where I click launch and hope it happens. And it's a scary, scary thing. Mm -hmm. It's like preparing for some, it's almost like preparing for jumping out of a plane. Yeah. <laughs> and and you've worked for two years to like train your body and get all the right stuff and have people meeting you on the ground, get you up into the plane. And now I'm just going to jump and on July 6th and I hope my parachute works. So let's yeah. just say. It uh, feels almost even like liftoff, you know, it's three, two, one, go. And then yeah, if, it's, yeah. if it happens. That's even better. That's even, and that's maybe why they say launch. Good point. That's yeah. probably better. The, uh, the liftoff. Yeah. So it's been uh, quite an experience that I wouldn't trade for the world, but man, I, 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 if you had talked to me a year ago, I would have been like, well, yeah, you know, I'm launching in the summer. I don't mm -hmm. know, you know, work on it a little bit here and there. It'll be fine. Like little did I know this would consume my life more than anything has ever consumed my life before. Unbelievable. Mm. So. Um, so you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned, you know, you started a company, you started a studio. It's mm -hmm. uh, Paverson Games. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the main goal of your studio? You know, like what, what can we expect from you and your studio, uh, moving past, you know, uh, distilled when it's done past Stumbo, obviously, mm -hmm. what can we expect from, from your studio? What's kind of like the agenda? Yeah. Yeah. So good question. So the reason, um, that it, it has games in the title is that of course I have a strong interest in that idea of, of interactive experiences. I always have, um, but I'm not going to necessarily relegate it to just board games or just video games. Mm -hmm. uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I have a, a strong fascination with augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, uh, but specifically, although I don't necessarily, uh, honestly, I have some scribbles and, and thoughts in my head about new projects. Um, right now, I, and all actually always how I've worked is very different than most artists or designers where they might say like, oh, I've got my next three designs already planned out. Mm -hmm. I've got, you know, I'm much more, the type of person that um, will jump, as you can see with my projects, jump from one medium to the next. I, I take a long time then to learn how that process works. And I do think it's probably more of my art background is because mm -hmm. of that. Where as a fine artist, oftentimes it's more about the message that I want to deliver to an audience um, uh, and how I can best deliver that message. Um, so I don't know necessarily what the media that is going to be but I know that it will always have to do um, uh, likely with, with elements of history and authenticity um, uh, and elements of play uh, and a really rich visual experience is important to me. Those are the kind of the three tenets of, of my studio. Um, and you see that again in working with Eric actually helped me uh, with the, he designed the logo for mm -hmm. the studio itself, which is a Sphinx that is holding a key so that idea of um, looking to history and looking to ideas of glyphs and symbology, but also with that idea of the key and, and puzzles and um, uh, how uh, I want to challenge the viewer, or in this case, the player, uh, to be able to uncover their, their own story through that process, while me also trying to help them be educated as well through the, whether it's the cards or the environment that I've created in a, in a game. Hmm, interesting, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to perhaps a VR project. I think that's that's something that's you know uh, happening and it's exciting in this in this space. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get into the final section of of the of the podcast. I want to ask you. Obviously, you do play board games, you do play card games, you do play video games. Which games would you recommend to your audience? So, like, better yet, what have you played? You've mentioned the Star Wars game. I'm a massive fan yeah. of Star Wars. So, if you have any, have you played? Have you played Imperial Assault? I haven't, but I know exactly oh. what it is. I know. Oh, it's so good. It's, it's really good. So really quick with that one, just as an aside, what's cool about that is that it's uh, one versus four. So one person plays um, uh, as as the Imperials, uh, as the Empire, and then the other four play as the Rebels. And it's just, uh, and, you know, there's mm -hmm. minis and all that stuff and different scenarios. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of like if you smashed D&D &D with uh, some sort of uh, kind of uh, war game with miniatures uh, where you get the story told for you. A lot of fun. Anyway... Um, as you can see, yes, I'm a big, big, big board game fan. Um, for and listeners, I'm... Dave has a, a wall of board games yes, behind yes, him. Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, there's a wall of board games here. And um, uh, I have a couple that I, I wanted to bring up that I thought would be good, especially for this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
uh, and so I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll list these, uh, and show them, but then you can probably link to them as well yeah, if you want. Yeah. Um, the first one is unforgiven. Uh, this is uh, all about the Lincoln assassination trial. Um, this is by Tom Butler, uh, and developed by Sam Hillier. Sam actually helped, um, uh, in the starting stages of distilled with some of the copy editing for the rules. Uh, so really great team there, but unforgiven would be one. It's a two player game and it's actually in, um, stored in kind of a box, uh, that is Ooh. a book. Um, so when you open it up, it's like a book itself. So that's kind of cool. So unforgiven is one. And again, very historically accurate. Uh, another one, and that's that's maybe for someone that uh, many people have compared to Seven Wonders Duel. So I love Seven it, Wonders Duel. Yeah. I have it right here. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so that would be one that you might want to check out. That was on Kickstarter. Another one that's going to be a lot more um, uh, friendly to new gamers would be Imhotep. Uh, so Imhotep um, uh, is a later game, but a lot of fun. Good to play with kids as well. Um, and it, it's it's it has a nice thematic um, uh, nod to Egypt and uh, building. Uh, pyramids, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's just a fun one. Again, a little bit lighter, but a good one for for that is Imhotep. I'm also showcasing um, my my board game thread. I have seven. Oh, Wonders nice. Here, duel. Nice yeah. seven wonders duel. Nice, good one. Very good. Yeah, and again, seven wonders is a fun one too. Again, a fun look at things like wonders of the world. Um, and then I've got two other ones, and one of these is very timely. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, on Saturday, this Saturday, uh, June 19th, will uh, actually be the first uh, Juneteenth that we'll be able to officially celebrate in America. And that's recognizing the abolition of slavery mm -hmm. uh, in the States. And a, a really cool game is called Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Uh, again, a really great game that, that focuses on um, the history of emancipation and um, the Underground Railroad in the United States with slavery. Um, uh, and then finally, kind of in that same vein, that is, uh, and by the way, uh, Freedom is probably a little bit heavier of a game. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is this next one is going to be quite heavy, um, but uh, is a great one. Um, uh, and that's Spirit Island. Uh, so Spirit Island is a cooperative game where you're playing um, yourself with others around the table. And you're playing as spirits on an island. And there are um, uh, 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 colonists that are coming to that island. And they are trying to lay waste to you and the local population of, of native individuals, indigenous peoples. And so it is your job to try and eradicate those colonists from trying to take over that island. So really good spin on, you know, so many, uh, unfortunately, and this is something we've, we have to work with in our culture. Uh, so many games are about colonization, which is not necessarily something that we want to necessarily look at mm -hmm. uh, these days anymore. So this is a great way to look at the op opposite side of that um, as well as spirit island. So um, those would be a couple. Spirit Island is not necessarily as focused on history. It does have you you are uh, fighting different types of colonies. So you've got uh, colonies from the Americas, from Europe um, uh, that that you would be, um, or I should say explorers, I guess you could say, that are mm -hmm. invading that space. So there is some history there. But beyond that, there's not as much. But I thought that would be a good one to highlight too. Wonderful. Thank you. That's like one, two, three, four, five with seven on this duel. And again, uh, listeners, viewers, the links to all of these games will be in the show notes or in the description, wherever you can find text. I'll, I'll make sure to, to put all of, all of the links here. Dave, final question for you. If you had one piece of advice for people like myself wanting to get into game design of, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of game design, what would your advice be? Yeah, so I would say it's, I'll, I'll do it to you. You can tell I like to talk. So I'm going to do a two-part question here, a two-part answer. The first one is, I would say that um, hold on to your dream and know it's going to take a long time. Mm. Don't think it's going to happen overnight uh, or obviously literally, but don't think it's going to happen within a few months or even a year. It's going to take time. Me working on Distilled for two years is actually short. Most people I meet, game designers, work on the game three to five years. Uh, so that's the first thing I understand is hold on to that dream. Don't forget about it and continue to, to, to hack away at that thing until it's what you want and, and what the people want. The second thing I'd say that's kind of connected to this and helps with this is do not try and do it alone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I tried to create Tombow alone, uh, almost. I had a little bit of help, but for the most part, it was just me. And if I could go back in time, I would, I would throw that out the window and bring a whole team on with me. And that's what I've done with Distilled. Uh, where I brought team uh, team members on that not only it's their their expertise that they can lend to that area, uh, but also um, I've uh, the game is so much better because of it. And mm -hmm. I've I've been able to grow my network of of collaborators and people that are on the on the Paperson Game is Distilled team. 
Uh, and so that's been a fantastic experience as well. And I'd never trade that from now on. I'm always going to have a team. Uh, I think it's the, the project is, is almost always better, I think, because of that. So those would be my two pieces of advice for aspiring game designers out there. And, and lastly, I guess, don't be afraid to reach out to people like me uh, for advice or, or feedback, because um, I was in those same shoes once. And I have, am so thankful of all the people that have taken the time to give me advice and support as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was very kind. Thank you. Um, yeah, so everyone, listeners, viewers, um, about more information from the History and Games Lab, uh, two exciting projects that we have for you. So on June 5th, we were about to do a stream of members of the lab, including myself, playtesting our latest game project, Line Rampart, A Viking in the Sun. However, due to technical difficulties, mostly on my end, I've upgraded my PC anyway, uh, that stream became a recording which we've decided actually not to put on YouTube this time around. However, we will be coming back to that project with a demonstration of the game after we've, we've figured out some things about the playtest. Uh, Dave, originally what our game project, the idea was to playtest it live stream on YouTube, but then nice. we realized that like, actually we figured out that there's a lot of things with the game that don't really work the way we intended them to. <laughs> so... Yeah. We will revisit the idea as a demonstration where we're like, okay, now this is the final, uh, close-ish to the, to the final project. So yeah. everyone, we're looking forward to Viking in the Sun. Please watch this space. We haven't abandoned that idea. We'll just kind of like re recalibrate that. Similarly, and I'm sure I've mentioned this on the podcast, the Lab and Student Society that spawned from the lab will both continue to be active throughout the summer, even though the academic year obviously has ended here in the UK. So please stay tuned for more information on future events. We have something at the end of the month that I can't really speak about quite yet, but stay tuned for, for more information in regards to that. Uh, if you have any feedback or would like to get in touch for a potential podcast appearance, our DMs are open on Twitter at hnglab, or you can email us at hnglabpodcast at gmail.com. For more on the History and Games Lab, please access our link tree where, uh, where you can find all of our output, the podcast, the playtest, the Instagram, the blog, the everything basically is in one single link. If you're looking, uh, uh, if you're on YouTube, if you're viewing the podcast, the link is on the screen. If not, you might find, you will find the link in the description if you happen to be a listener. Uh, Dave, thank you again so much for being on. Uh, where could our listeners find more about you? Yeah, so they could uh, feel free to go to distilledgame.com and that's going to be where they can find out quite a lot of information uh, that'll link them to. They could sign up for our newsletter to know about Kickstarter on day one right away. They could go to the Kickstarter page and find it as well. Uh, but I'd say distilledgame.com is the best mm -hmm. place to go uh, to learn about the team, learn about the game. There's a blog about all the process that I've been blogging for the last year or two. So that might be a, a nice thing to learn as well. And again, the Kickstarter is coming out. It's launching July 8th. Uh, July 6th. 6th. July 6th. Yep. 6th. Tuesday, July 6th. Yep. It'll be uh, 7 a.m. my time. So that will be probably around 1 p.m., I want to say, uh, your time. Yes. Yeah, so uh, July 6th, 1 p.m. UK time. Perfect. Yep. Again, mm -hmm. a, a link to the Kickstarter page, to the website, to everything that I think you might be interested in, in the description, in the show notes. Um, uh, Dave, one last thing from you, uh, if there would be one, one thing, uh, that, uh, listeners and viewers could take away from this podcast and only one thing, what is your like final words? What would you like to emphasize? Ooh. Well, I think, um, I would say that don't be afraid to pursue your passions, uh, and integrate those with your research. And that's what I've discovered over time is that I make the best work. Uh, when it's merging things together. I love board games. I love whiskey. Um, mm -hmm. Why not make something together? Or I love uh, history in the outdoors and I love video games. Why not make something together with Tom Bo? So figure out what, what makes you tick and what really drives you and figure out how to make a project about that. And I think that that's going to be a big part of how you can find success and fulfillment, self inner self-fulfillment from those projects. Perfect. That's that's really well said. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much for joining me. Everyone, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Until next time, see ya. The Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast is a production of the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. For more on us and future podcasts, connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and or Facebook by searching for Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. We should be the first result. 
Music for today's episode is Call to Adventure by Kevin McLeod, used under filmmusic.io standard license. For more information on the link and the license, please check the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join us next time.